Harika Weiser was from Beaverton, Oregon. She was an 18 year old woman who was studying at the University of Texas. She found her love for ballet in the sixth grade and was now majoring in theater and dance. She was enjoying her time at university so far and her first year was going well. On Sunday the 3rd of April 2016, Haruka made a call to her friend Sylvia at 9.30pm that night. She had just finished class and Haruka was just calling to let her friend know she was on her way back. Haruka had no idea that someone with horrific intentions had been watching her. The following day, on Monday the 4th of April, the Texas police received a phone call from one of Haruka's friends. The friend was concerned as she never made it back to the dormitory after her class the night before. And now, she had not shown up for the Monday morning class. Her friend gave a brief description of what she was wearing when they last saw her. She was wearing all black clothing with Doc Martin shoes and was also carrying a blue duffel bag. Inside the bag was a MacBook computer and some college coursework. On Tuesday the 5th of April, there was still no sign of Haruka. The University of Texas police began to search the area where she was known to walk. Along the route, they went around the Etta Harbin Alumni Center on campus. Just behind this venue was Waller Creek, and there, they found the remains of a woman who fit the description of Haruka. The body was naked and showed signs of extreme trauma. Two days later, the body was confirmed to be Haruka. Her body was covered in bruises. Somebody had strangled her, and just where she lay, there was a rock covered in blood. Somebody had grabbed her by the head and repeatedly bashed her head against the rock. Whoever had done this had also forced themselves upon her. There were no injuries on Haruka's hands, which means that she either didn't try to fight back or that she was unable to. The attacker had gathered sticks from the area and placed them on top of her body in an attempt to hide her. The items that Haruka was last seen with were not found at the crime scene. They did, however, find a pair of glasses. News of a murder on campus struck great fear and sadness among students. They were encouraged to walk in groups when on campus. The hunt to find who was responsible for this abhorrent crime was underway. Detectives reviewed the surveillance footage from the 3rd of April, along the route where Haruka was known to walk. On the footage at 9.20pm, they found a suspicious man wearing glasses on a woman's bicycle, attempting to open the doors of a van. He lingered in the area for some time, before leaving and then returning to the van at 9.38pm. It's then when a woman in black on her phone can be seen walking towards the alumni center. The suspicious man watches the woman as she passes by. He then puts the kickstand down on his bike, reaches into his back pocket and pulls out a shiny rigid object. He then begins to follow the woman. The next time the man is seen on camera is at 11.47 pm. He is walking alongside the bike but this time without his glasses. He is now carrying a bag that he didn't have before. The bag appeared to be a blue duffel bag. He walked away with a slight limp. The person in the footage became a suspect and a snippet of the video was released to the public in hopes that somebody could come forward with any information. Fairly soon, the police received a tip from the Austin Fire Department. The Fire Department had some vital information to share. Information that would lead them to the person responsible. They told the police that on the 4th of April, the day after Haruka had gone missing, firefighters were sent to an abandoned building. There, they found a 17 year old homeless man who was burning some items. The police arrived shortly after 
and identified the man as Mikkel Kreiner. Mikkel had told them that he was 17 and homeless, so they brought him to a youth shelter. The fire service had taken his bike for safe keepings. Some of the firemen recognized the man in the CCTV footage and they also recognized the bike. The police had also confiscated his belongings, which included a backpack and a blue duffel bag. Because he had been starting fires, the police had interviewed him in their police car. The interview was recorded on film. Mikkel was wearing the same clothes as the man captured in the CCTV footage. Investigators took a picture of the blue duffel bag and showed it to some of Haruka's friends. The friends recognized the bag instantly. That bag belonged to Haruka. Investigators then went to the abandoned building where Mikkel had been burning some items. They found the spot where the fire had been and among the ashes, they found a notebook with college coursework and a Doc Martin shoe. The shoe was the same size and style that Haruka had been wearing. Just three days after her body was found, on the 8th of April, the police arrested Mikkel at the youth shelter. When they went through the bags, they found a MacBook with a Portland sticker. Haruka's mother had actually previously told the police that Haruka's MacBook had a Portland sticker on it. They also found clothes and a jacket that matched up with what Haruka was wearing. In one of his other bags, they found gloves, rope and condoms. The evidence was strongly pointing in the direction of Mikkel, who was now charged with first degree murder. He told the investigators that he was not responsible for the brutal murder. He claimed that he had found the bag with a laptop, and as for why he was at the campus, he told them that he had discovered a storage room on campus. The door was unlocked and he had been staying there for as long as he could, hoping that nobody would catch him in there. The trial began on the 11th of July 2018. Mikkel pled not guilty and things became very strange. Mikkel told the court about his early life. He explained that he was abused by his mother. Because of this, he was placed under the care of his grandmother during his childhood, who he also claimed often beat him. The Child Protection Services then placed him into the care of his auntie. And then one day, he packed his things and he hitchhiked more than 300 miles to Austin. During the trial, he spoke about his high school life and began laughing, recalling a time when he was arrested for stealing a pair of boots from Walmart. He then spoke about how he would often get into fights during school. He said, I hate violence, so I try to stay away from fighting. The prosecutors then presented some very strange and disturbing evidence. Investigators had found a tablet in Mikkel's possession. On this tablet, they found a document titled Enchanting Eyes. The document started with an introduction that read, This is only for readers who are 18 or older and like stories about sex and rape and blood and family sex and more blood. Prosecutors then showed the court a journal that had Mikkel's handwriting in it. The journal contained writings that were very sexual and graphic in nature. One of the writings was titled Therapy Gone Wrong. The story was all about a man who forced himself upon a woman and detailed how the woman screamed for help multiple times. The people in the courtroom became very uncomfortable when they heard the writings. As the prosecutor was reading out the documents, they asked Mikkel if he would like them to continue reading it. He then strangely replied, I'm just trying to figure you out. Mikkel then told the court that his writings were inspired by the porn that he watched. Two damning pieces of evidence were then presented to the courtroom. A pair of glasses found at the scene of the crime. 
In the CCTV footage I mentioned at the beginning, the man on camera was wearing glasses, and then next time he was seen on camera, he wasn't. The prosecution managed to find a store manager from an IMAS Express. The store manager testified that she had actually sold the same frame and lens prescription to Mikkel. He denied that he had ever bought them. Then, the second damning piece of evidence was presented. Some hair that belonged to Haruka was found on a t-shirt in Mikkel's belongings. The hair matched with 99.9% .9 accuracy. The prosecutor then said, so all we have to do is decide if you're the person who did this. Mikkel responded by saying, pretty much, but I don't like my odds. Throughout the entire trial, Mikkel claimed that he never saw a woman walking alone that evening and denied being the one who took Haruka's life. On the 20th of July, 2018, Mikkel was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Because he was only 17 at the time of the crime, he was spared the death penalty. Many have speculated that Mikkel would have more than likely struck again if he had the chance. Haruka's father has said that he finds comfort in the fact that he will no longer be able to kill again. And since her murder, the university has spent $13 million to increase security, lighting and cameras in hopes to prevent this from ever occurring again. What I find quite scary about this case is that Mikkel seemed like such a normal, everyday nice guy, which I guess is a reminder that the people who are capable of committing these horrific crimes don't always look or behave like a caricature of a killer. They are usually just your run-of-the-mill average people, the kind of people you interact with every day.